if you take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 John chapter 2, and uh, we're going to continue on as we go through 1 John, one of the letters of, of the Apostle John, as he writes to the churches as life unfolds and as the, the flow of things happening in, in the gospel going out uh, in the days after the ascension of Jesus, the years after the ascension of Jesus. And 1 John is there towards the end of your Bible. It's not quite into Revelation where things get strange. Uh, it's just uh, just right before that. So if you open your Bible up and you find yourself in Habakkuk or Zephaniah, just keep going towards the back. We don't, we don't want to do Habakkuk right now. Uh, because Habakkuk is not particularly cheerful. And we would like something a little more cheery than that one. But 1 John chapter 2 and, and remember that he's writing, John is writing back to a church. He's writing back to people who are believers, but they, they, you kind of get the feeling that they, they've known Jesus for a little while. And, you know, sometimes it feels like some of those moments, you, they, in our lives it happens as well, that the, the enthusiasm starts to wear off a little bit. And the problems start to come, and, and whereas you can start off and everything is great, but after a week or two, you start realizing, I still have to go to work. You know, the, 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 the field still being dealt with. This has still got to be dealt with. The tax has still got to be paid. I've still got to do this. I've still got to do that. So remember, he's writing to people who are trying to follow Jesus in the midst of living everyday life. The people that the, that the letters of Scripture are written to are not people who get to live in a vacuum and get to kind of step back and go, oh yeah, we just live over here in our own little Christian community where nobody else bothers us and everything works out fine and, and you know, the, the, everything just kind of flows down and, and there's all these easy things in life. It was ordinary life, much the same as we deal with it. And so as we look at the text, starting in verse 7, John writes to them and says, Dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have already heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. And, you know, John kind of dips into the preacher well here. Well, it's not old. It, it's, a, it's the same old thing, but it's also... Something very new. And I think that one of the things to draw from this is that he's reminding them that on the one hand, this is nothing new that you're hearing. You've been told this over and over and over again. You've heard it from the beginning. This has always been what God has said. But sometimes we need to just hear it new and be reminded that this is not dead. And it's not bland. It is Ongoing. The one who says he is in the light but still hates his fellow Christian is still in the darkness. John really is, you know, and he's talked about this in the passage before. He's going to bring this up as he goes on through. And you, you just can't help but think as you read through this that he's dealing with folks in the church that just can't seem to get along with each other for whatever reason. It may be that they couldn't get along with each other because they had different backgrounds. You had believers who had come from a, a Greek background and some who had come from a Jewish background. You had folks who were good Roman citizens. You had folks who were wealthy Roman citizens. Then you had people who had been conquered by Roman citizens. You had people who had been enslaved by Roman citizens. And so all these outside things maybe occasionally caused some strife in the church. There also would have been inside things that caused some strife. Some that believe, well, this is important, and that's more important. We see pictures of that when Paul writes to the church at Corinth and talks about how, well, some of you say, you know, you like this, this preacher, and you like this preacher, and you like that preacher, and you like that preacher better. He even says that, points that out to the Philippians, that there are people who are, well, you know, some of y'all are upset because that guy's preaching and that guy's preaching. John says, look, you have to remember, you can't hate your fellow Christians. one who says he is in the light but still hates his fellow Christian is still in the darkness. We can't hate one another. And that includes these days. In those days you just kind of had one church in the, in the town. There weren't that many believers in the first place. And as it grew, they also, as they met house to house, 
They didn't meet as the whole group very often. Usually it would have been, you know, this little group over here met at Jerry's house, and that little group over there met at Jerry's house, and there's not any more Jerry's left in the room to keep going with that. You know, that group up there met at Mike's house, and this group over here met at Mike's house. Well, we only got one of our buildings today, so there, you know, we got Bill today, we don't have Billy, so we can't do that one, but, you know, this group met here, and that group met there. And every now and then, when they could, they met all together. Now we meet in all sorts of churches all over the place. You got this church, you got that church, you got that church over there. You can even see it when you look at our, our bulletin where we have our list of churches that we're praying for. And this week, we're praying for First Baptist and for First Baptist. We even have two different churches with the same name. What we have to make sure that we don't do, we have different reasons that we are who we are, but we cannot hate one another, even if we have trouble sometimes getting along. That's got to be true of us as believers one-on-one. -on -one. It's got to be true of us as believers from one church to the next. The one who loves his fellow Christians Christians resides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his fellow Christian is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And this is really the ideal passage to do with Sunday night church, but we don't really have Sunday night church anymore because you could have turned out all these lights, and there's not enough window in the flip building for nothing. I mean, we could really get a feel for what it means to sit in darkness. And if you've ever tried to pass through this room, say on a Tuesday evening, you know, after deacon's meeting, you want to go out that door to go to your house. And it's dark in here. <laughs> There's no screens on. There's no nothing. And believe me, I have found every third pew coming down that aisle. All in an effort to not find the bricks on the other side. Walking in darkness hurts. And one of the things that happens, I think, is that our hate that, and our dislike and our hate and our frustrations with one another cause us to walk in darkness. And then we end up hurt. And then we get mad about the fact that we're hurt. And we take it out on somebody else. Because let me tell you something. When I have walloped my, my foot, stubbed my toes against three different pews coming down that aisle, if I then go home and the cat steps on my foot, I'm going to respond to the cat in anger and frustration. I'm not acknowledging this is a dumb animal. And the real problem was me. And sometimes we do that. We get bruised because we try to walk, we walk in darkness, and then we lash out. John then writes, I write to you, little children, that your sins have been forgiven because of his name. And when he says little children here, he's talking about new believers in the faith. He's not just talking about Isaac, which is good because Isaac left. But he's not talking about you know, little children necessarily physically, but spiritually, new believers. I, Understand something. One of the most important things to get right is that when you first come to faith in Christ, your sins have been forgiven. They're paid for. Jesus paid it all. Amen. This is one of those songs that we sing, and honestly, the only reason we shouldn't sing it every Sunday is because after we sang it every Sunday for about six weeks, we'd all be able to sit here and sing it without thinking about it. Amen. And we wouldn't think anything about it. But how important it is to remember, if you don't start your walk with Christ, understanding that Jesus paid it all, your sins have been forgiven, then you start going the wrong direction. Because if you say, well, my sins have been mostly forgiven, but I've got to do this too. Then you start trying to build your faith with, I'm going to throw a little bit of works on the side. My sins have been forgiven as long as I remember to tithe. My sins have been forgiven as long as I remember. 
to do this. My sins have been forgiven as long as I remember to, to, to come to church. My sins have been forgiven as long as I remember to come help bring my shovel and help spread out the... No, we're going to use power tools for the big pile of dirt. Some of y'all got a little bit scared looking in your face. The Lord has blessed us with power equipment. We will use that blessing. If we don't start with, my sins have been forgiven, then we start feeling like we start building in this, I have to earn. And so the first thing to get right is, your sins have been forgiven. Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus was raised, Jesus is ascended, sits at the right hand of God the Father. Your sins are as forgiven as Jesus is risen. And that's, that's, that's the limit. So if he's not dead, and he's fully risen and fully alive, then your sins are fully forgiven. It all hinges not on you, but on him. And so don't keep trying to make it back about you. Well, I have to do this. Now, there may be things that God has called you to do in obedience that you've got to go do, but your forgiveness doesn't hinge on it. And we used to try to use family relationships as an example. You're always your parent's child. Whatever you do. But one of the things that we realize, what, one of the things that, that a lot of us have found in ministry is that too many families have never quite been great at showing that unconditional love, that unconditional relationship, where when you say, it's just like you're always your parent's kid, you're, you're always your dad's, dad's son, your dad's daughter, your mom's son, your mom's daughter, no matter what you do, too many people end up having to sit there going, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Because, you know, there was that one time that I did this in, in, in college or shortly after college. There was that time I was out shooting pool and I was supposed to be doing something else. And, and, and mom sent me a message that said, no son of mine would do that. If that's what you're doing, you're not my child anymore. And so we, walk, we, don't, we don't automatically associate unconditional, lifelong love even within our own families. And we should do better about that as Christians. For one another. Because God does that for us. And that's what we're supposed to show. Little children, your sins have been forgiven. If you have surrendered your life to Christ, your sins have been forgiven. Because of his name. The only thing you had to contribute was you had to be a sinner. And you know what? That's the easiest thing in the world to contribute. To your need for salvation. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He's writing to remind the church, all of you, as you get started, remember this. Your sins are forgiven because of Jesus. Because of what he has done. Not because of what you have done. I'm writing to you fathers that you have known him who had what that did. Pixels are running together. I am writing to you. I, I am writing to you fathers that you have known him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you young people, or young men, that you have conquered the evil one. He's talking to, to fathers, he's talking to folks that are, as they are maturing in the faith, he's talking to the leaders of the church and those who are growing up into that, to the teachers, those who have been walking with Jesus for a while. Fathers here are going to be people who have, or some of the first to accept the faith. And the ones that other people look to, he says, just remember, you've known from the beginning don't go back. One of the important messages that, that comes up over and over again in the New Testament is don't go back. Once you come to Jesus, don't go back. And don't go anywhere else. That's what Galatians leads with. Don't go someplace else. Hebrews is don't go back. First John, don't go back. You may think you need to. You may be hitting some frustration. Stuff may not be what you think it would be. Life may not be as easy as you thought it would when you raised your hand when that preacher said, who wants Jesus? Life may not be as easy or as simple as you had hoped it would be. But don't go back. You've always known. Some of you grew up in church. Many of you grew up in church. And so you have known from the beginning, 
Your, your telling of how God prepared you and equipped you to follow Jesus starts with, Mama put me in the church nursery when I was six weeks old. Or it may go back farther than that. It may start like mine. And they used to have a little bulletin board outside the nursery with expected babies on little sheets. Y'all may have never done that here. That used to be a habit of, of, some, of some churches. When they knew that there were babies coming, they'd put up a little, they'd put up a little sheet, incoming baby, and keep track of it, because that was part of how they built their prayer with a parent in prayer. You may have always been, it just took a time at some point that God spoke to you and called you out individually to surrender your life to Christ. But you're, you're, you've known from the beginning the songs that you memorized as a child or some of the ones that we sang this morning. You, you know, when you sing holy, 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 you're like, I remember that. I'm writing to you young people that you have conquered the evil one. That's a part of the, the maturing process in Christ is to realize, you know what, we're going to push away that evil one who keeps trying to trip us up. Those moments that you just kind of, you feel like you're, it doesn't mean that you don't occasionally trip, and you may not even see what you're tripping over. You may have even given what you, you may want to try to give it a name, but the main thing is this, you know that you're going to get up and keep moving forward. That's what it is to have conquered the evil, and it's not to be totally perfect, but it's to realize that he, that he's behind you. I have written to you, children, that you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, that you have known him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young people, that you are strong and the word of God resides in you. And then he repeats again, and you have conquered the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Don't misread that. Your spouse, your children, your parents, your cousins, most of them, aren't the things in the world that you're not supposed to love. You're supposed to love the people in the world. You're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. It's the stuff that gets to be such a distraction. It's the earthly power that we need to be able to get the stuff that becomes such a distraction that we are not supposed to love. Because those things of the world, those things in the world that, that become that distraction that we chase after because you can't chase both things. Our pastor years ago liked, liked the saying that he picked up on the mission field, which is you cannot chase two impala. I think it applies to more than just a pair of Chevys. I think it applies... You know, okay, there used to be a car called a Chevy Impala. Some of y'all obviously didn't catch that. But it really, it's, it's from Africa. He was a missionary in Zimbabwe, and the church in, church in Zimbabwe had that as a saying. And for more of us, it would be, you know, you can't chase both 10-point bucks. You can't chase the up-river catfish and the down-river catfish. You can't chase the... the, the the brim in the lake and the bass in the river at the same time. You cannot chase after two separate things. You have to pick one. You can chase the things of the world or you can chase the kingdom of God. And if you chase the kingdom of God, you will lose some of the things of the world. Amen. You will miss out on some of the things of this earth. You will you will find yourself at points looking at your life and going, I don't have what he has. I don't have what she has. You will encounter moments where your children or your grandchildren will look at you and say, why don't we have what the guy down the street has? I'm going to school and Timmy's got all this stuff and we don't have all the things Timmy has. Why not? And your answer will have to be because... I had a choice one day. I could chase those things or I could chase after Jesus. 
Jesus provided a roof over our heads, food in our food, foods, food in our bellies. Yeah, grammar has failed us. Food in our bellies. And even if he didn't provide that, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have him than anything. As we've sung, whether we sing it in the old way or sing it the newer one of the Lord, you are more precious. Nothing I desire compares. Do not love the world or the things of the world because then when the things of the world become threatened, we get scared. And the only thing that ought to scare us as believers is if the kingdom of God is threatened. And you know what? The kingdom of God can only be threatened if Jesus isn't on the throne. And, uh, if you haven't read the book enough to know that Jesus is always on the throne, let me encourage you to spend some time this afternoon and read through it. Because what you will find is that Jesus never leaves the throne. He is always from here until the end of eternity. For all of eternity. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. So we can either love the temporary things of this world, the earthly kingdoms that will pass away, or we can love the kingdom of God and we can chase after the love of the Father and go that way. But you can't do both. You just can't. You may be smarter than everybody else you've ever known. You may be better than everybody else you've ever known. But you still can't. Cannot chase to and love. In fact, it's a good way to get run over by one of them. Or trampled by a wildebeest. Depending on which impala you're chasing. Because all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the arrogance produced by material possessions, is not from the Father, but is from the world. Everything that's here is not, you know, all these, these things that he's talking about, he's not talking about just the reasonable life, he's talking about that desire for more. That never-ending, ever-growing hunger that, that drives itself with this idea of how much is enough? Just a little bit more. How much is enough? Just a little bit more. How much money is enough? Just one dollar more. How many years in office is enough? Just one year more. One more year. How many people that I can be in charge of at work is enough? Yeah, just a few more. How many more promotions in the, in the job ladder is enough? Just one more. Just one more. Just the next one. Just the next one. How much land is enough? Just a little bit more. How much? Just that much more. That desire, oh, just that much more for me. Doesn't come from God. And remember, the world is passing away with all of its desires, but the person who does the will of God remains forever. All this other stuff will pass away. Every last bit of it, every, almost everything that I have lost sleep over and worried about in the last 30 years of my life, probably 40 years of my life, I don't remember much before that, Most of that stuff will be gone. The houses, the land, the inheritance, the oh, this, I gotta hold on to that. I got the, you know, that, that box of stuff that I've had since the first time I moved out from mom and dad's house. It all passes away. This little reminder of this great victory, this, this thing over here, it all fades. The world passes away with all of its desires. What remains is those who do the will of God. What remains is the result of the will of God. What remains is the God who loves us and us who have followed him. And live in his love. So as we look for love, we can look for love 
and that and all the things of this world, but it's going to pass away. Instead, we should look for love and the love that we need in our Heavenly Father. Because really and truly, the biggest cry and the biggest emptiness in most of our lives is that need for love, that need to be cared for and cared about. And I pulled a whole lot of statistics that I could put us all to sleep with to talk about how the, the recognition that these days loneliness and, and, and isolation are so destructive. The epidemics of, of suicide, and alcohol abuse, and drug abuse, so much of it comes back to loneliness, people who are looking for love. cultural shifts that we've made or people that want to just find, I just got to find love someplace and they go grab hold of wherever they think they can find it but where we should find it ultimately is in our Heavenly Father because that's the one love that will never disappoint that is the one love that will not let us go, that is the one love that will last eternal. So what do we do about that? First, we need to know that love ourselves. We need to know that that love accepts us, embraces us, forgives our sins, and sets us on the path to grow. God loves you so much that he'll save you from your sins. He'll save you just as you are. But he also loves you so much that he won't let, let you, doesn't want you to continue to live with that. He wants to move that out of your life and help you grow away from it. Because his love will not let you stay in anger, bitterness, frustration, selfishness, self-destruction, all those things. Therefore, it is his love that drives us to grow and change. But first, we need to know the love of Christ. Know the love of the Father who sent his Son to die, rise again, that we could be forgiven. That's the first step. The second step is to realize that as he has loved us, so we ought to love one another and love him. And that we cannot separate and say, I love God, I just can't stand people. Man, you may not be great at showing your love for people, but you got to have it. I mean, all of us sometimes struggle with how with showing love for people. Sometimes it's because of the difference in personality. Sometimes it's because of the difference in, in upbringing. Sometimes it's just because... You're having a bad day, it's a little harder to show love, but you may feel it. You've got to have it. And love is deeper than a feeling. It is instead an action that commits that you will put the better, what is better for the other ahead of yourself. Love is a commitment to treat other people as the, the way that God would see them treated. And that starts with what would God do for them if they were bad? He would die for their sin. What would God do for them if they were struggling? He would heal. What can we do to be a part of that and to be like that? What can we do to love other people the way God has loved us and then to show our love for God? Both individually and together. We show that by sharing his love. We show that by reminding one another of his love. We show that by encouraging one another. I dare say that you will not bump in to a fellow Christian this week that couldn't use a little bit more encouragement than they've got. And you don't have to give them the encouragement but then turn around and make sure that you do something to help keep their ego in check. If they really have an ego problem, God will deal with it. Most likely, they don't have one. We've just kind of picked up this habit. Don't want them to get too proud. Encourage, show that love, and then show the love that God has called us to show towards Himself, and that is to say that whatever He, wherever He leads, we'll go. Whatever He calls us to do. 
we will do. That we will love the ones that he loves. All those that he has died, that Jesus died for. Which is everybody. After all, let us not love with words or with tongue alone, but in deed and in truth. This is what the Lord calls us to do. It's what the commandment has been from the beginning. To love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. And to love our neighbor as ourselves. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to follow you in all that we do. We pray that you help us to show your love to everyone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We come to a time in our service. We call our time of invitation. We invite you to respond. It may be that you need to come and ask what it is to know the love of God in the first place. You may need to come and ask for prayer for something. Whatever it is, we're going to stand together. Ladies are going to come back and lead us as we sing. And I'll be standing here. I'll be glad to talk with you, to pray with you about whatever's on your heart as we stand together.